Hi, I'm Dave Hillowitz. So first, let me apologize. My voice is kind of off because uh, I have a cold. So you'll just have to do your best to pretend like I sound totally normal. Okay, so the past few weeks I've talked about uh, different aspects of creating instruments, recording, editing, chopping up samples and stuff like that, and we did a little bit of scripting. Uh, this week I wanted to talk about looping, specifically creating looping samples. Um, it's just one of the ongoing headaches of anybody who's had to do this for a while. Anytime you want to make a sample loop, it's just, it's always a manual process and it's uh, prone to error and it's, it's just frustrating. So I wanted to cover a few pieces of software that might make our lives a little bit easier, but there's no magic bullet here. You'll, you'll always have to do this a little bit manually. Okay, let's go. So what do we mean by looping? Of course, what we mean is uh, sounds that go on forever. Um, and there are some cases where that really does make sense, like synthesizers, for example. A synth lead probably is going to extend forever, almost always. Um, but there are other instruments, like a piano or a plucked harp, uh, where the natural decay, where at one end of the waveform it's really loud and the other end of the waveform it's really soft, is exactly what you want. In fact, that's kind of the whole point. Uh, I'll give you an example here. Uh, I've got a harp. Uh, I actually built a harp a, a little while ago, and uh, I'll probably do a whole other video about that at some point. But um, here is a sample. Now let's imagine that I tried to isolate part of that and make it loop. Kind of loses all of the character. I mean, it sounds like a synth. You might as well have a synth there. Um, so if you're doing an acoustic instrument and it's a plucked instrument, you're probably not gonna wanna have it loop. So let's look at how we do looping in contact. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this sample and I'm gonna pull in probably the easiest case for looping. like. Uh, by far the easiest kind of thing to to loop is um, a synthesizer waveform that's a very basic synthesizer waveform. So like a sawtooth wave or uh, a sine wave or something because um, what you're looking for when you're trying to create loop points is you're looking for periodicity. You're looking for repeated patterns because what you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate a pattern and you're trying to find the start point of the pattern, the end point of the pattern so that the pattern can just be like repeated over and over and over again by the sampler. So I'm gonna pull in C4, uh, we know the, the note number, it's very convenient, and I can actually spread it uh, for the entire length of the keyboard, and this is what it sounds like. Okay, so it ends after a second. So what we need to do is we need to set a loop point, which is extremely easy because this is a synthesizer waveform and a very basic one. So I double click on it, it brings up the wave editor, and uh, in order to get a, a, a sample loop activated, I just click this little one here. And you can have up to eight uh, looping segments, um, which you know allows you to loop different parts of your waveform. And generally with a sound, uh, what you wanna do is you wanna find something that's after the initial attack. You can see here, even though this is a synthesizer waveform, and in theory, every single oscillation is gonna be pretty much the same. This is an analog synth, and when it first triggers the, the oscillator, it's a little bit different. It's actually, you can see the waveform actually takes a little while to settle into a groove. So what we wanna do, is we wanna just kinda of choose an arbitrary chunk of this in the middle. And if we play it, now it's gonna make a, a clipping noise. So obviously we don't want that clipping noise. We want it to be completely smooth as though there's no looping going on. So what we need to do is we need to zoom in, which we can do using this little button. And we can see essentially the start point, a microscopic version of the start point and a microscopic version of the end point. And the goal is to have those waves mesh. So on the left side, we have the end point. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna drag it so it matches up. And now if I hit the same note, no clipping. Of course, that's an artificially easy scenario. Setting waveforms for a very, very basic synth patch is just always gonna be very, very easy. Um, it's a pain to do it manually. It's also something that like, there are algorithms out there that will do this for you, and they're pretty good at figuring that one out. Um, so basically what's easy for a human is also easy for the computer. Okay, so while we're here, we should talk about the loop modes. So there are a bunch of different loop modes. Um, until end is the default one. And basically it means that anything after the loop uh, is ignored. So you hit the key, and now I'm gonna let up. So as the sample's decaying, it's continuing to loop. 
what this means effectively is that this chunk of audio after your loop is never used. And you could actually, in theory, just truncate your waveform and save some disk space. It seems trivial, but when you have like 8,000 samples, getting rid of those tails is actually pretty useful. So then if we go to until release, this actually does use this end chunk. So we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna hold down the key. Now I'm gonna let up. So you saw what happened there. Instead of looping forever and letting the entire release phase play out, it actually just went into this tail portion and played that, and it actually ran out of waveform to play. Um, so in a sense, the until end is a better default, and that's why they've probably picked it as a default. Okay, and then we've got these sub modes, until end forwards and backwards, and until release forwards and backwards. Now look what happens. So it's playing the loop portion forwards and then it gets to the end of it. And instead of cycling back to that nice, perfect loop point, it's actually playing the sample backwards. So forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Not that many samples sound good that way. So you're probably not gonna use it that much, but there are occasional uses for that. Okay, then you've got this interesting parameter count. You'll see here that uh, contact offers the possibility of having eight different loop points. So you could in theory have a little chunk here and then you could go here and be like, I wanna make another chunk here and then here and then make another chunk here. And then you could say, I want you to play this one three times and play this one twice and then this one, play this, zero means forever. So, okay, now I'm gonna play it. It's gonna sound terrible because I didn't actually fine tune those loop points, but watch what it does. Okay, I personally never found a use for having multiple loop points in a sample, but I'm sure that there's a use for them somewhere. Then there's some pretty uh, sophisticated things like you can put a grid here. And this is actually more useful for if you've sampled a drum loop and you wanna chop it up and kind of manipulate some of the sounds. It also works for synths that have like a gated trance or an arpeggiator or something rhythmic. Um, you can use it to kind of chop up the sample and then sync it with MIDI, which is pretty cool. Okay, so we've looked at this very basic synth waveform, and that's probably kind of an artificial example because it's just so easy to work with. What if we have a real world sample like uh, a violin? Uh, I'm gonna get my violin and we're gonna record just one note and we're gonna try to manipulate it in contact and see how difficult that is. Okay, so we have our violin note here and I'm going to rename it. Okay, now I'm gonna pull in the violin note. It's one note up from an F, it's probably about an A, I don't know. Worry about the tuning in a little bit. Okay, so we've put it here. Okay, so we've got our violin and we don't have any loop points set. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the start point here. The end point looks good. And as you can see, this waveform is a mess. And the reason it's a mess is because when you play the violin, obviously you bow down, then you bow up, then you bow down. And every single time you do that, you completely change the dynamics. You completely change the actual waveform that you're generating. And the violin is a complicated instrument. That's kind of what makes it sound so nice. By the way, I should get rid of this filter. Okay, I was wondering why it sounded so muffled. Um, so I'm gonna set a loop point and I'm going to drag this. And I know I don't want it to be at the very start because we don't want the very start to repeat over and over again. But see what happens if I choose a very short chunk of this wave. Maybe we say, okay, we're past our attack phase here and that's probably as close as we're gonna get. So now I'm gonna play, play that note again. So the problem here is that we have a very short chunk of audio and the loop sounds one way at the beginning, sounds a different way at the end. And that repetition, that repetition of a short chunk of audio over and over and over again is very, very noticeable. So what we want really is to have a much, much longer loop so that the ear kind of can't remember what it sounded like at the end when it gets to the beginning again. So let's say we were able to take this whole chunk and loop that that's probably as good as it will be. 
Now we're going to zoom back out and we're going to hear how that sounds. Ooh. So that was kind of brutal. With violin, you actually have an option. There's some string libraries that just try to extend notes as long as possible. And basically what they do is they have these string players play uh, like a single note for as long as they can possibly hold it. And then they try to find a loop point in the longest part of the sound. That works. Not completely natural sounding. The other option with a violin, because you have these multiple rebowings, is you can include the rebowings as part of the sound. Spitfire's British Drama Toolkit actually did that recently. They recorded uh, all these string players doing what I just did, bowing and then rebowing and then rebowing, and they looped it after two or three rebowings. Your ear kind of can't tell because the samples are so long. That's not what we've come to expect from a string library. It's a pretty clever technique though, and it sounds pretty great. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's play with this some more. I think the rebowing happened here, and then I think the other one happened here. So let's, let's uh, try that. Okay, so that sounds bad, but there's another option that we have, and that is crossfading. And it's a pretty clever um, thing that a lot of samplers have built in, which is basically what it does is it takes a little bit of audio from the beginning of the loop and pastes it at the end of the loop and vice versa, so that um, the sample points are much better meshed. Um, and here's what that sounds like. I'm gonna just enter in an arbitrary value. Okay, so you can see it got rid of the click. It still doesn't sound natural, but it sounds a lot better. Okay, so let's say that you don't wanna use contact to set your loop points. There are a bunch of reasons why you wouldn't. Uh, for one thing, if you set the loop points in contact, those loop points and that all of that work that you're putting into each sample, finding the loop point and all of this fine tuning, that's stuck in contact. There's no way to export that data out of contact. So if you ever wanna use another sampler like Ableton Live or SFZ or something, you'll have to redo all of that work. So I would almost always rather set loop points in an external audio editor. I just, uh, I don't like the idea of being stuck in a specific piece of software. Even free audio editors like Ocean Audio uh, allow you to set loop points. So if we wanted to set a loop in Ocean Audio, what we'd do is we'd select a chunk of audio and we would right click it to create region and loop. And we can call it whatever we want, it doesn't matter. And then we're just gonna do convert region to loop. Okay, so we've saved it, and now all we need to do is go back into contact and re-import the sample, and there, you can see the loop point's been set. Of course, Ocean Audio is actually really, really hard to work with for setting loop points. It doesn't have anything like this uh, loop editor. It's just, it's not really set up for that. It can edit the points, it can delete them, it can change them very slightly, but it's just not a tool that's very well suited to this. So let's take a look at some other pieces of software that we could use. So there are a bunch of freeware options. Um, there's something called Loop Auditioneer, which is uh, a piece of Windows software, which I've managed to get to work uh, f kind of um, uh, using something called Wine Bottler, which is a thing that lets you run pretty simple uh, Windows apps on your Mac. Um, I'm trying to run it now. As you can see, it takes forever to launch and the user interface is pretty kludgy, but uh, it does work in a, after a fashion. Okay, so let's check out Loop Auditioneer. And what you do is you point it to a directory. You don't point it to a specific file. So there, we've got violin note and we've got violin two. So you double click on some sample and it shows you the waveform. And it also shows you any loop points that might be defined in it. Um, and then you have options up here like uh, auto loop. Auto loop tries to find the right loop point for a specific sample. So what happens if we click this? So it's searching for loops. Ah, sorry I didn't find any loops. Okay, so it wasn't able to automatically find any loop points. One cool thing that this does have that uh, Ocean Audio doesn't have is uh, it has a loop tweaker. If you do view loop points, uh, this is basically just the same view that uh, Contact was showing us before, that loop edit button. This is the way that uh, Loop Auditioneer does that same thing. It's basically just showing us the waveform at the start and the waveform at the end, and we can try to make them match up as much as we want. So, and we can of course hear the sample if we want to. 
In this case, we're hearing how awful of a looping job I did in Ocene Audio. Then you can do crossfading. And let's, uh, this is the duration of the crossfade. Let's say we did okay here. How's that sound? Okay, so that fixes the clipping point. So this is already a pretty useful tool. You can use it to burn that auto fading right into your sample. Um, you can use it to tweak your loop points. Uh, even if it can't automatically find the loop point for you, uh, it's still pretty useful. There's also a pitch detection algorithm, which in this case seems to have come up with wildly different estimates as to what note I was playing. Um, MIDI note 60, MIDI note negative 558, MIDI note zero, not very useful. Uh, I have found it to be pretty useful with more consistent samples, but with something like a violin where you've got vibrato that's actually changing the pitch slightly throughout the entire length of the sample, it's pretty much useless. Okay, so that's Loop Audition here. Definitely worth having on your hard drive, but it's not going to fix everything. Probably the best piece of software that I found for doing this is actually uh, Steinberg's WaveLab, uh, and it works even in WaveLab Elements, which is I think $99 right now. So let's check that out. So here we are. This is WaveLab Elements 9.5, the latest version. So let's take a chunk of audio here and what we're going to do is we're going to right click on it and we're going to do create loop from selection and then we can listen to the loop. Okay, so it sounds terrible. Now we're going to go into loop tweaker, which is, uh, and you're probably pretty familiar with these windows by now, this is exactly what we had in contact. But the difference with what we had in contact is it's actually looking for loop points um, based on its own algorithm and it's looking for them automatically. These blue buttons um, allow you to kind of um, move the loop start and loop end, but instead of moving it by individual samples, uh, it's actually looking for um, waves that actually match up a little bit. So there we go. That's a pretty close match. Now let's listen to that. Okay, so it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect because this is not a sample that's really meant to loop. But if we go here and we do crossfade, it's got these crossfade points that are automatically set up for us. So if we were to hit apply, it would actually modify our audio, and here's what it sounds like. That's probably too short of a loop, but it gives you an example of what you can do. Then there's this funny other tool, Tone Uniformizer. What it does is it chops up your wave into little slices and then it overlays it over the entire length of the loop to make it smoother sounding. Here's what that sounds like. So it's pretty artificial sounding. One of the things that it does is when it's doing that process of kind of chopping things up and, and overlaying them, it also does a pre-cross fade, meaning that um, you get a little bit of that before your loop point. And the reason for that is they know that their weird sliced up audio is gonna sound a little odd, especially right next to audio that has not been screwed with. So they have this delicate fade that kind of deals with that problem. I don't use the tone uniformizer very much. It's kind of useful for um, like synth patches, but for like natural instruments like a violin, it's, you know, it's gotta make it sound much more artificial. That being said, the loop tweaker is just an amazing uh, feature and totally worth it in my opinion. Okay, so another cool thing that WaveLab can do is it can actually detect the pitch of your wave. So if you go into sample attributes here and you hit create, because what that does is it creates a metadata header for your wave file. Uh, you select a little bit of audio and then you do detect from audio selection and it uses some algorithm to determine the pitch of your sound. If you pull this into contact, it's going to set the root key to A2, which is super useful. Okay, so I kind of wanted a better real world example other than this one violin note. So I'm going to sample these wine glasses and see if I can't make a contact library out of it. Okay, so I just spent about half an hour recording wine glass samples, and I've got a bunch of samples that sound like this. So pretty much all I did is I selected chunks of audio pretty much arbitrarily, uh, and I created loop points by right-clicking and then doing create loop from selection. Once I'd done that, I went into the tweaker, went into crossfade, and just hit apply. Uh, that does the automatic crossfading. I didn't manipulate any of the settings. Um, and uh, then I saved it, and now I'm ready to go into contact. See you there. Okay, so now I'm back in contact. I dragged all of my samples in. I actually made four groups so that I could have some round robins. And um, 
Yeah, so when I uh, opened up any of the waves, basically all of the loop points that were set in WaveLab are already in contact. And it's a beautiful thing not to have to futz with the wave editor at all. Um, yeah, let's uh, see how it sounds. So yeah, that was <laughs> an interesting experiment. It's kind of pretty, but it's also a little bit eerie, uh, maybe better suited for horror movies or something. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's looping. I hope this video was helpful. I'm gonna put a link to the instrument in the description to the YouTube video. And uh, yeah, if you've been enjoying these videos, uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Take care.